All right, so Romans chapter 6, last week, Romans 5, the, the big uh, topic was justification. So we're build, we'll build on that. Uh, justification, really, I guess, use it from a, uh, like a courtroom, a judicial standpoint. It's basically being declared innocent. It's being cleared of all charges. It's uh, being, being made right in the sight of, uh, you know, like we were saying, in terms of the government or the law, in terms of God who is the law, he's the almighty. He's the one that really determines the right and the wrong. For him to declare us righteous in his sight, then uh, that's justification. And then the things that went with it. So when we get to chapter 6, uh, we'll read verse number 21 of chapter 5. That leads us into verse 1 to give us the context here. And then there will be a, a central point here as you can go through your, your outline there. We won't stop and read that. Uh, I'll just go verse by verse and then you can read as, as you see that. But it says in chapter 5, verse 21, it says, That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So that being said, you see the difference between sin. Its limit is, is death. That's as far as it can go. That's, that's, that's the ceiling when it comes to sin is death. You think, well, man, that's, that's the fi final. No, there's something above death, and that's eternal life. That's God. And that's where, uh, that's where grace reigns in that respect. So notice verse 6, and here is the argument you're going to hear, have people make, and yet this is a chapter that will completely disassemble and make uh, void the argument that being saved by grace would produce a lack of a righteous life or the incentive not to live right and rather live unto sin. So notice verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Verse 2, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? So the topic tonight really is going to center around that, that three-word phrase, dead to sin. Now think about that. If you were dead to something, then, 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 there, then it no longer, it's, it, it, no, nothing would matter. You're dead to sin. And that's where I believe that the Christian needs to understand the position that we're in. That's why a Bible study like this is a reminder because people that don't live a victorious Christian life are doing that because they've made choices that are just, it's, it's their own choice. There's no such thing, well, you know, so we're going to get into this so I don't get ahead of myself. So how shall we that are dead to sin, notice that, live any longer therein? So it's saying... Uh, no, we don't, we don't have the license to go out and do what we want because actually we are dead to sin in the spiritual sense. Now notice as we get into this topic of baptism, uh, Dustin happens to be the latest one here in our church to be baptized. Uh, I was, uh, often I think when I come to church or go anywhere, when I come to the uh, end of uh, Went Road where we live and to come to Highway 62, just to the right, there's a little old, little old lake to the right, that's where I was baptized. Just, just a little reminder I was baptized in that little old lake there after I got saved. And uh, so for everybody that's been baptized, notice exactly what baptism means. It says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Now think about that. Baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. All right, that's why that, this baptistry picture is a, a grave, if you please. That, like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And you have what I have there. Every time you hear me do a baptism, I actually memorize this in, uh, in Bible college. And, uh, and uh, I said it when, when uh, Dustin got uh, baptized, but uh, in obedience to the command of our Lord and Master, and upon a public profession of your faith in him, I baptize you, my brother or my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, buried with him in the likeness of his death, this is where we get this from, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. So, again, when Jesus was baptized, that, that has nothing to do or symbolizing a cleansing of sin. It just does not. Too many people look at that. In fact, when you meet a lot of people, they say, well, how do you know you're going to heaven? Well, I got baptized. What they think is, and what somebody has taught them by a great era, is that baptism represents a cleansing. In other words, when I went and got baptized, then that's when, that's when they think they got saved, or that's when they think they got, uh, they got cleansed and all of that. And, and they confuse that because perhaps when Jesus was baptized, 
the Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove, and of course he was immediately taken to the wilderness to do the will of God. Baptism has never meant or never pictured cleansing from sin. What it pictures is exactly what we just read here. That, that, that baptistry there pictures a grave is what it pictures. So Jesus, what he was saying is, I'm not getting baptized to be cleansed of sin. This is my life that I'm giving to my Father. So by the, by the appearance and by the model for us, when Jesus came up out of that water, he was saying, look, this is, this is my life, and it's all to do the will of the Father. It had nothing to do with him being cleansed of sin because he was never a sinner. He's the Son of God. If he was a sinner, he couldn't die for uh, himself or anybody else. So I'm saying that because that's why something like this is so important. So if there ever is a discussion, that's why you ought to know these things. Baptism pictures a burial, and it pictures a resurrection. And uh, so that's why when it leads from verse 2 into this, it's saying that's why when you got baptized, when you got saved, when you got saved, then you became dead to sin because you became alive uh, righteously speaking, uh, spiritually speaking. All right. So notice verse 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, interesting the word planted because even Jesus said in his ministry, except a corn of wheat or a seed of corn be placed into the ground and covered, buried if you please, then it would never come up out of, it would never come up out of the ground and yield fruit, corn, so he was picturing the fact that when he was going to be, when he would die on the cross and would go into the grave and be resurrected, that's the reason why you and I can have eternal life is because he paid the price, so he gave his life, he died, of course, and then when he was resurrected, then think of all the eternal benefits that comes from a resurrected Savior. Therefore, the word planted there is a very interesting word. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, all right, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. So that's why you, you've got this new life, all right? So notice verse 6. Knowing this, and I think that's an important phrase, knowing this, we should know these things, that our old man is crucified with him. Who's the old man? That's the, that's the old nature. It's crucified with him. Now, most people don't think about the believer as being crucified with the Lord, but Jesus was crucified on the cross so we're not crucified literally, but in a sense, the way we live our life and the way something has died, the old nature is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. So that's why you can live the righteous life. In fact, you can't live a righteous life without being saved. Anybody can go through the attempt and the motions, but there's something totally different a totally brand new world, it's apples and oranges, uh, for someone to live unto God and do the righteous acts. Now, anybody could give money to the poor, but you take a saved person who does that because they're saved, neither one of those things yields uh, eternal life, obviously. But the point is, is that the righteousness of God has been placed upon us, and the big thing is this idea of sin. Look, an unsaved person is bound to sin. They're going to sin. They have no recourse. However, a child of God does have victory over sin. Now, you still have that old nature, but I'm here to tell you, you've got a superior nature in the nature that you gain with God, and that's why we are dead to sin. So when we sin, we, hit, we still choose to do that. And this idea, well, I can't help it, don't ever say that. You can't help it. The problem is either we're not strong enough in the Lord, we're not walking with Him, we, we're a lot of things, but when the Bible says we're dead to sin, now either we have to believe that or we can come to ourselves and say, well, that just don't seem logical. Well, I'm going to believe God and say, God says I'm dead to sin. And uh, that's why baptism is a much more important thing than, than people realize. And that's why I want to say it to us tonight. Now, we don't have anybody who's going to get baptized, but the point is, be honest with you, when you got baptized, whenever that was, for me, I was uh, 12 years of age, you know, that's really me saying to God, God, my life is, is dead to me, and it's alive unto God. Now, I wonder how much on a regular basis do we say to God, God, as I get up this morning, I'm going to remind you and I'm going to remind myself, uh, my life is dead to sin and my life is alive to you to do whatever you want. My, your will be done. Now, you have to ask yourself, how often do you do that? I mean, how often do we live that? So, we are free from sin. Isn't it amazing? In those verse 8. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. 
Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. So that's a, that's a truth, and it just means that uh, that'll never, ever happen again. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. So it's reminding us again that just as Christ was dead and is alive, then the way we live our life should be exactly just like Christ. Christ will no longer die. He doesn't, you know, keep dying and keep dying. He, he, he died once, and he's alive forevermore. This is also a picture of eternal security right here. You don't get saved, get unsaved, get saved, get unsaved. You become just like Christ. You become dead to sin, and you're alive forevermore. That's a spiritual birth that cannot be reversed. No more than your life can be reversed. The truth is, anybody that's born in this world, even if they're not saved, is going to exist forever. They're not living because uh, they're going to go to a place called the second death. They don't have eternal life. But the point is, uh, you just don't annihilate. You're just not going to be annihilated. And for someone to say, you know, I got saved one time, but I'm not saved anymore, that's, that's, that, that's, that's a very erroneous statement. You may be out of the will of God. You may have never been saved. But if you ever got saved and there was a, there was a spiritual uh, birth that happened there, then God says that happened and you became alive. And it would be just as erroneous for us to think that Christ would come every year and die on a cross and resurrect from the grave or do it every month or do it another time. It doesn't work that way. So all these doctrines are very important because there's a lot of religions that just teaches plain heresy. And if you're not careful, you listen to some of these things, you get influenced by them, you might read a book, and all of a sudden you go, I don't know about that, and we start to question God on this. So we do have dominion over sin because uh, he has dominion over death, and that's, that's why verse 11 says, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign, in your mortal body. Of course, the word reign means to have a, like a king or a queen, a magistrate, a, a dictator reigning over a nation, having power. So let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, the bodies that you live in, that we, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Now that's a command of God like any command is. I have to yield to that. You have to yield to that. But the fact that it says that means that we can have victory. Now there's too much of this easy, non-biblical preaching that kind of, now, 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 you're okay, that's the way you are. Look, I understand us being the way we are and all that kind of stuff, but there's a point where you cross where people say, well, uh, if that's the way you are, there's nothing that can reverse that and there's nothing wrong with it. I'm here to tell you, if you're not right with God and God calls something an abomination or God calls it sin, then you can't tell God, God, I was born that way, that's just the way I am, and God says, well, I got something that's, that's more important than that. It's my word, and there's also a victorious life that you can live, and I'm afraid that uh, we're too much influenced by people who don't preach victory over sin um, through our Lord Jesus Christ. So let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members, that your, that'd be your body, as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. But yield yourselves unto God, there's the key part, as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Here where we start to really shift gears, it's not only about not sinning, but it's about what we're supposed to do. It's about saying, God, these hands are no longer, imagine if I used to be a thief. I say, God, I got saved. These are not, these members, this hand is no longer going to steal but these hands are going to be used to be a blessing, to do the work of God. And, and this tongue, if it was used to, uh, to, to hurt and destroy, then I'm going to use this tongue for the glory of God. There's too much uh, that's just not spoken about yielding and yielding and yielding ourselves to God to do his work. And uh, that's why it's important to hear these things because uh, that's as biblical as, as John 3, 16 is. So verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you. You know, maybe we ought to memorize that phrase and look at look ourselves in the mirror every morning before we go out and meet anybody and say, you know what? For sin shall not have dominion over you. And that means whatever you struggle with, and there may be people in this room who struggle. Now, there, there is without a doubt, you don't take many people to put them in a room, and uh, what, what, what you think in your mind and what you think in your heart 
you, you'd be totally embarrassed and, and almost, uh, you'd be so embarrassed if people knew what you thought about on a regular basis, about people, about sin. Uh, I was shocked when I heard uh, uh, a preacher would stand up and say, it was, it was actually like a preacher's conference, and he says, you know what, you'd be surprised uh, preachers who have, uh, who have problem with pornography. And I thought to myself, what? How could that be? And I can honestly see and tell you, my wife knows me, and uh, I, my life's an open book. If someone, if someone walked in here and says, we're going to, if, like people that run for public office, and they said, we're going to check your entire background, we're going we're to go over you like a fine-tooth comb. I said, you go right ahead. I said, but, uh, but I'm going to tell you something. Uh, if you're not careful, sin can have dominion, but it's not supposed to. And I'm here to tell you, you say, well, nobody knows about it. Look, God knows about it. And if it keeps you and I from doing what we're supposed to do, and you sit around and you struggle, you struggle and you struggle, you say, well, I'm not going to do this. Let's just say that uh, you don't go soul winning because you've got such a bad thought life. You say, man, I just, I just couldn't do it because I need to get that right. And then you spend the rest of your days never doing anything about it. You know what? That's a sin. Just like whatever's in my life. If I say, Lord, uh, that's a tough one. God says, look, sin shall not have dominion over you. And if we don't take that as a, not only as a promise and take that as a pattern of living, then there's a reason why then we, we look around and look at Christianity as like some limp, powerless uh, uh, entity. I just don't believe that, folks. And, and people sometimes get upset because it sounds so harsh because, like, people live such a lifestyle differently. Look, if, if we can go home and leave something like this and watch filth on television and it doesn't bother us and we sit and listen to things that's just as vile as they can be and we go, well, that's, that's just the way it is. I'm going to tell you something. We're deceived. And we're never going to have revival until we start having revival in, in, in our pews. I mean, there's no doubt about it. I know the lost need to get saved, but I'm going to tell you something. If we pride ourselves on coming even to church like this tonight and say, well, you know what, but I got all these issues, but you know, at least I'm, I'm doing this. Look, we need to say, you know what, I'm not going to let sin have dominion over me because that's not only possible, that's, that's the pattern. It says, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Now, here's where I think it's a tremendous testimony for grace because we started out in the chapter the idea about grace, when we looked at the very last verse of chapter 5, it talked about even so might grace reign through righteousness. And there's too many people, a lot of people, I don't know how many people, but you hear this mocked. They mock the grace of God. They mock and say things like, well, if you believe that, then you'll go out and do, live any life you want to. I have never thought that. I've never heard anybody legitimately ever say that except somebody who did not believe that you could be saved and saved eternally. It's always those who bring up a statement like that that does not believe God. And I don't, I don't have to get caught in that trap. I'm here to tell you that uh, the Bible says, for you are not under the law. That means the law could not, the law cannot get me to a place where I'm righteous with God anyway. We already saw that. But to say, well, I, I, uh, I live by the law. I've met people who say that. I've met them. And uh, they don't do anything for God. And uh, they, 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 don't, they, they, they mock people that believe eternal security. And I know what I'm talking about because that statement, you think, man, why would it say we're not under the law? Because we're not under law. We're under something that's even greater and even more superior than the law. You know what it is? It's grace. The law came in to say every one of you is a sinner. And we're going to show you just how bad you are a sinner. Here's the laws. You'll not be able to keep them. You're supposed to keep them. You may come to a point where you keep some of them. But the point is the overall part of the law is to say you need Jesus, the one who kept all the law, who is the law, and to be saved by grace will make you live a much more superior life than the law ever, ever thought you could. And if you don't believe that, just look at the people who crucified Jesus. These were people that were, we'll just use the term superior to the law. And the great test of the law at that point was, okay, then we're going to send the perfect, sinless Son of God into their midst. And if the law will produce a product that will be perfectly righteous, then we're going to send the perfectly righteous one into their midst. And he's going to walk in there and he's going to speak the words of God. He's going to do the words of God. Let's see what those who are keeping the law will do. You know what they did? They crucified the Son of God. Now... That's just a fact. And uh, we're not discounting the law. We're saying there's something more superior to the law. 
the grace of God is, what, is what's going to keep you living right and, and, and doing the things you're supposed to. That's really what's being said here. So notice verse 15, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. That answers the question. Again, I've never met anybody that said, oh, goody, I got saved. I'm saved for eternity. So now it's my life and I'll be in heaven one day. Nobody has ever said that that was ever saved. I'll promise you. I've never shook a man's hand and said, you know what, praise God, I'll see you next Sunday, maybe, because I don't have to go to church. I'm going to heaven anyway. I can just do anything I want to. That has never, ever been said. Now, a lost man may say that, but a saved person is not going to say that because they don't believe that. That's just erroneous, but uh, that's why uh, the traps get made when you, when someone, if you, look, if, if, they, if you realize someone's not saved and you're trying to have a spiritual conversation with them other than trying to help them get saved, just exit that situation because you'll, you'll walk away with mud all over you. They don't get it. They never will get it. These Pharisees didn't get it. And yet they were, in the eyes of the law, so to speak, would be, uh, we'll just say guiltless, but that, that's really not true either. All right, so notice verse 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. There you go. You get up. Someone gave the illustration when I was a little kid. It's kind of died off now, but uh, it said that one day uh, an Indian man got saved, and I think he was a chief or something. And they came to him and said, how are you doing? He said, hmm, me have trouble. Black dog and white dog fight all the time. And he was talking about his old nature and the new nature. He says, well, 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 which one wins? He goes, mm, the one I feed the most. So that makes sense. See, if we don't, we don't walk it with God, then the sin seems to have dominion, and it, it shouldn't be that way. So you yield yourself, yielding, yielding, yielding. That's part of being a, a, a disciple of Christ. Verse 17, but God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. That's the gospel, so you got saved. And notice what it says, ye obeyed from the heart. Again, people mock. Well, somebody just believes that's all they got to do. If you think that's, 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 that's a little thing, you talk about a person's heart that has to say to a holy God, I'm a sinner, I need to be saved. Uh, the Holy Spirit has to bring that to, their, to their, their attention. These people mock this. These people go out here and somebody bows their head and gets saved. Let me tell you something. I don't know how you got saved, but everybody gets saved the same way. They get saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you cried and groveled for five, six hours and you got saved, so be it. If someone walked up to you and said, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Like Philip said to the Ethiopian eunuch, I do believe he's the Son of God. And uh, he got saved just like that. The thief on the cross got saved, and it didn't even sound even like a sinner's prayer to me. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He got saved then. Now, the point is, You'll never hear me get up. In fact, I'll be criticized for being harsh about how to live. And it's not my rules anyway. It's God's rules. But this idea that, that grace is some kind of easy living and uh, just, do, no, that's, look, if, you, if you're saved by grace, you're going to fight every day this, this old flesh. But the Bible says you get saved when you get saved in the heart there. Of course, when we get to chapter 10, that'll really manifest itself. So we won't get ahead of ourselves. But look at verse 18. Being then made free from sin, you became servants of righteousness. Uh, I don't know, sometimes people don't like that terminology, being a servant to anybody. But we are servants of Jesus Christ. We're disciples. We don't hear that much anymore, do we? It's almost like a discipled one, a disciplined one. It's like someone that's in sports and they decide they want to be a champion. So they, take, they get up earlier than everybody. They, they don't eat the, the fast food and the junky food. They eat good stuff and they watch their weight and they, and they do their do all the things they're supposed to do, and, they, and they, they limit themselves to certain things because there's an end result. They want, they want to be a champion either as an individual or as a team. And God says if you're going to be a champion for God, then you need to be a servant of the Lord and a servant of righteousness, and we're able to do that. All right, verse 19, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness and to holiness. That's really Paul just saying, look, he says, I know some of you, or I know, I know how mankind is. You, at one point, you lived by the flesh because that was all you knew. So if we get out here and we get mad at people that do what they do, that's, that, that's what sinners do. And, uh, but uh, the people that ought to really be 
shaming themselves as the Christian that knows better. Verse 24, when ye were the servants of sin, that's when you were unsaved, ye were free from righteousness. In other words, in other words, you can't be. You, you, were, you, were, you were separated from doing right because you were already a servant to, to, to sin. And it says, uh, verse 21, what fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Everything without God will end in death or uh, like that. Verse 22, but now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Now here's the classic verse, and really we, to be honest, we, we, we take it, it's not out of context, but we, we, we kind of do in a way, because the context here is really about a Christian and what they can look forward to as far as what's left over because you live the righteous life. For the wages of sin, now the word wage, I have, I have, I have explained this to so many people. Uh, I remember when I was in Chicago, I did because it was a lot of soul winning. And I'd go to somebody and I'd have a little New Testament out and I'd say, uh, I said, well, what does that word there say? I said, it says wages. I said, where do you work? And they said, I work at so-and-so. I said, so they pay you to work there? And they laugh, yeah, a little bit, you know, they, not enough. I said, I understand. I said, but you do put your time and uh, your, your effort into a place, and they pay you by the hour, by salary. Yeah, yeah, because that's what you deserve, right? Yeah, yeah. I said, well, the Bible says here for the wages of sin is death. I said, how would you like to get a paycheck every week? And it just had one word on it, death. Because we all look forward to a paycheck. Everybody looks forward to a paycheck or a tax refund or whatever. And uh, so imagine... Going to God and saying, God, I want my paycheck for this week. He says, okay, here you go. Death, if you're not a Christian, of course. The wages of sin is always death. It never yields anything more. The, the, the culmination of all sin will yield physical death and spiritual death. That's, that's all sin does. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And obviously that means that when you get saved, that eternal life is eternal life. But it also means when you look at the context here, that if you became, in verse 22, if you were free from sin and become service to God, and it says you have your fruit unto holiness, that means everything you do for God and with God, then it's going to yield, uh, it's going to yield, well, in the case of winning a soul. Imagine going to heaven and saying, is there anything here because of my effort as a child of God? And you look and say, oh, yeah, there's Joe. Joe's here because I, I led that person to the Lord. I didn't save him. The Lord saves but my righteous acts of being a witness and all that I did uh, as a preacher, I'm going to stand before God and give an account. I'm going to give account of what I preached to you folks. If you think, man, you, you, I'll tell you who, who I preach to uh, more than anybody. I preach because of God. Because God's going to say, look, that's my church. It's not your church. That's my people, not your people. And uh, that's my message. And, uh, and uh, you're going to give an account. And, uh, and to be honest with you, uh, I'd hate for one day you stand before God and say, well, God, that preacher that we had, he never told me these things. And I'll guarantee you there'll be some of that going on. Now, imagine me standing, and, and if God did this, I don't know how God's going to do it, but if God said, you come over here, you were their pastor. Yes. Do you ever remember preaching this passage right here? And God, I'm sure, would give me the ability to, yes, I did. Well, they say you never said it. Well, I did. Now imagine God saying, well, I'm going to bring it to your attention here because uh, we are accountable. Now, if I was the kind of preacher that just wanted everybody to like me and wanted to fit in with the modern ways of the way things are, I wouldn't preach half of what I do. I'd be crazy. We'd have more people here. There's no doubt about it. I could fill this church up next Sunday, and you give me a month, and I'll promise I could have this place full if I trimmed some things and did just a few things but they'd be compromising things. I know I could. However, I want you and I to yield the wages of righteousness. And uh, first of all, we've got to get people saved, obviously. We've got to get people to understand they can't have victory and should be having victory. And uh, you don't want to stand before God and say, well, you're here by the grace of God, no doubt about it. But the grace of God is not just to get us to a destination called heaven. The grace of God is to teach us how we can live this life that's dead to sin and now we're free to righteousness. So 
that's real plain. It's not easy because it's a lot of work. And at you know, 10 to 8, you're going, man, I worked all day. Now I've got to think about how I've got to live my life. And it's, it's, it sounds kind of rigid. It's not rigid when you give it to God. It really isn't. If you, if you, if you think about how you've got to do it, then, yeah, it would be hard, wouldn't it? Because we all have kind of tendencies and stuff like that. But uh, I'm no different than you are, folks. You say, man, you, you make it sound like it's easy. It's not easy for me, I promise you. Uh, my wife lives with me, and I live with her. And, uh, but I'm going to tell you what, I, uh, I, I work hard at this. I don't just go, well, uh, that's just the way it is. Now, she hates that statement anyway. It ain't the way it is. So we're going to say this all together. Turn to chapter 6, verse 14. You're there. And we're going to, we're going to say together at the count of three these, these, these words, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we're going to start with the word four, and we'll end with the word you. We're going to say them together. And that means you're saying it for on your behalf, and I'm saying it for my behalf. But this is going to be one of the last things we say. So you ready? Uh, Romans 6, 14, on the count of three, then we're going to start with four. One, two, three. For sin shall not have dominion over you. And that's you, and that's me. So you think about that.